Welcome everybody to this, the fifth in our summer lecture series titled From the Rooftops. These lectures are coming to you from the Landscape Architecture Department in the Weizmann School of Design here at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. My name is Richard Weller, I'm the Chair of the Department and today it's my great pleasure to introduce Dana Tomlin, our speaker. Uh, Dana joined the faculty in 1991 after having taught at the Ohio State University School of Natural Resources as well as the Harvard GSD. He has a PhD in Forestry and Environmental Studies from Yale, an MLA from Harvard and a Bachelor of Science from the University of Virginia. Here at Penn he's been the recipient of the Perkins and Lindbach Awards for Distinguished Teaching. Uh, he also serves as a member of the faculty in city and regional planning and teaches an, as an adjunct professor at the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. Dana's teaching and research focuses on the development and application of geographic information systems. He is the uh, founder and co-director of Penn's Cartographic Modeling Lab. He's the author of GIS and Cartographic Modeling, a seminal text, and he's the originator of Map Algebra and he's a member of the GIS Hall of Fame. Um, indeed, Dana is considered something of a guru in this area, and so it's my great pleasure to introduce him today. Enjoy the lecture. Let's just say I have mixed feelings. Earlier today I got a message. It was another message asking about the challenges I was facing as a result of the pandemic and what I was doing in order to meet those challenges. Of course, the first major challenge that came to mind was having to respond to questions like this. And the best way to do so seemed pretty much just to ignore them. For similar reasons, I was really not at all anxious to make the video you're about to endure especially because this would take me away from something a lot more important. But then it occurred to me, maybe I should use this opportunity to celebrate that something and do so in ways that might be meaningful even when this crisis is behind us. So here we are. What I hope to do over the next half hour or so is to talk to you about two things. The first is what I've been doing over the past few weeks that I found to be so challenging and rewarding. And the second is to place all that into a broader context that I hope will relate to you. Now, since I have no control over who you actually are, let me tell you right up front who I'm going to pretend you are. I'm going to assume that you're a prospective student, one who has enough curiosity or at least enough patience to spend time considering an online video entitled Weather Mapping. I have to tell you, I was awfully pleased with myself when this title occurred to me, not only because it's just so cute, but also because it captures both the rhyme and the reason as to why I've been spending so much of my time as I have. Each day for almost two months now, I found myself anxious to get out of bed in the morning in order to capture several hours in anticipation of a standing 8.30 a.m. meeting that has featured voices from Mexico, India, and Belarus, as well as Southern Connecticut. The reason for these meetings is a project initiated by the Yale School of Medicine. Its initial charge was to build on what had recently been done by Johns Hopkins University to distribute information on the spread of COVID-19. Our mandate was not merely to replicate the pretty wonderful online dashboard that they had developed, but to try to use digital mapping techniques to make this kind of data even more meaningful. One way to do this is to focus on Connecticut and to map COVID statistics not just by county, but by town. Another has been to depict each town not only by its number of cases, but also by the proportion of that town's population that has so far become infected. The fact that these data were reported daily made it possible for us to map the spread of the virus over time as well as space and to generate pretty pictures like those you see here. I use the term pretty pictures in this context not at all to be disrespectful but almost just the opposite. Throughout the project I think it's fair to say that each of us has quite literally been brought to tears while clicking away at the keyboard and becoming engrossed in our world of numbers only to be sobered by the brutal reality that those numbers represent. In any event, we recognized pretty early on that in order to be of any real significance, our pretty pictures would not only have to engage attention, but also compel behavior. And in order to do that, they would have to strike closer to home. Literally. They would have to translate town-wide statistics into what's happening at actual locations on the ground. We do that by applying each town's rate of infection 
to an estimate of its population at any given point. The result is then a map on which each point's value therefore estimates the number of infected people at that point. While it's easy to confuse these estimates with actual field observations, and generate no small amount of local consternation as a result, by the way, it's nonetheless very helpful to see how the risk of infection varies at scales of individual human activity. By relating risk to precise location, it's also possible to investigate spatial relationships. Suppose, for example, that we suspect a relationship, however unlikely, between COVID-19 and proximity to bodies of water. By generating maps of these variables and comparing them over large regions, we can often begin to detect the degree to which such relationships actually exist. The ability to generate interpretive maps can also affect logistics. What you're seeing here is a map on which testing centers are shown in yellow, travel times to those centers are shown in varying shades of gray, and levels of estimated COVID presence are shown in shades of red. This sort of assessment can provide a basis for the sighting of those centers in ways that attempt to minimize overall travel time or traffic in any one center. Most recently, our attention has turned to nursing homes and prisons. We've also solicited proposals from colleagues, and among the responses are projects ranging from cell phone tracking to mass transit, financial stimuli, telemedicine, religious practices, reinfection, neuroimaging, and so on and we've now extended our reach from Connecticut to encompass the entire country. Rather than say any more about this project, however, I'd like to talk instead about the tools and techniques that it employs, and the manner in which these are introduced, applied, and developed here on campus. We've been using several computing platforms, one of which is called Google Earth Engine. This is cloud-based software, and that's significant. In moving from the desktop to the cloud, we dramatically increase our ability to access enormous volumes of data to process those data much more quickly and to disseminate results immediately with minimal effort. Let me show you some examples. What you've been looking at are data indicating variations in temperature over space and over time. The same is true here, but we're looking at a much smaller area and over a much longer period of time. Likewise here in Las Vegas. And again, this is not just a matter of presenting data in ways that are more evocative, but also a matter of interpreting data in ways that are more revealing. What you're seeing here, for example, is a map of nighttime lighting. These are monthly readings that have been taken over several decades now for just about every location on Earth. They indicate both the total amount of light at that location, as well as the amount of light that has remained stable over time. Now, if we subtract stable light from total light, what remains is light that has fluctuated for some reason over the years. And that reason can often be interesting. Consider, for example, this urban growth near China's northwestern border, or this apparent refugee camp in Malawi, South Central Africa. How about this odd pattern off the coast of Argentina? Or these little blips in eastern Montana that up close look like so. Now, though Google Earth Engine is technically still an experimental platform, it's actually been around for several years now. Ours was the first academic group to work with Google on this platform, and I'd like to try to give you a sense of what that interaction was like. I can do so by way of a clip that opens with a questionable nod to my own ego, and which offers one to my son as well, but which then goes on to convey a spirit that would otherwise be hard to convey and which has been central to this whole endeavor. So indulge me for just a few moments. With that, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Dana Tomlin, who, for those of you who do not know, is really one of the fathers of GIS. And I just have to say that it's a, a really a great pleasure to have him on the panel with us today. Thank you. To the best of my knowledge, I'm the father of only uh, one son. <laughs> and, <coughs> come back to that uh, momentarily. In 2000, what was it? Well, it was the move from the desktop, perhaps, to, uh, to web services. In 2005, certainly uh, uh, Google Earth, uh, mobile devices. But uh, what is it today? Well, <clears throat> I can tell you that from uh, my perspective, it's, it's two things. One is the opportunity to uh, really go a uh, mapless. What I want to do is to be able to uh, walk outside, not have to bring more reality into the, uh, the lab, but to bring more of the lab out into the, uh, the real world. And I uh, not only want to be able to sense what's around me, I want to be able to look over there 
and see uh, 1850. I want to look over there and know something about the radon. I want to be able to walk down the road and uh, feel the, uh, the crime statistics. And not only do I want to be able to uh, receive these things, I want to be able to make gestures. I want to be able to put that Walmart over there. And as I do that, I want the landscape to react. And I don't mean react just by putting a swatch of red on a piece of uh, paper. I want those trees to squeal. <laughs> I want a wristband on my hand that gets tighter and tighter the more I screw up the environment. I want to take advantage of those same tactile, visceral capabilities that are otherwise applied in uh, video games. I just got a, uh, seriously, I just got a um, text message from my wife as, as uh, Karen was talking. It's about my son. My son is a 22-year-old, um, not unlike some of my other kids around here. He's in a very competitive filmmaking program. His name's Matt. Matt just called. Screening went over the top, phenomenally great, very happy. Professor said, best in three years has to become a feature. That has nothing to do with my talk. I just thought I'd share that with you. <laughs> Actually, it has, it has everything to do with my talk because this afternoon I've had the opportunity to see some of my other kids about whom I know I'm going to be uh, just as proud in, well, I already am, but just as proud in uh, several months. Google came here over the past couple of days and uh, did indeed knock our socks off. And I tell you, we truly plan to reciprocate. Thanks. In addition to Google Earth Engine, we've also been relying heavily on the ArcGIS family of software. And I'd like to try to give you a sense of how this is brought into the classroom. I'll start with something you've already seen that map indicating travel time to testing centers in Connecticut. A typical student's first exposure to this idea of travel time mapping begins with the agenda for an upcoming lecture, much like the one from which you're about to see a clip that I've sped up just a bit in deference to your patience. So first thing I need to do is to create this uh, friction grid. And of course, I do that with uh, reclassify, indicating that I want to reclassify uh, development, setting the uh, two road categories, that is one and two, to a value of one second uh, per meter and everybody else to uh, 20 seconds per meter. And I'm going to call this friction. There it is. I probably should color it up appropriately so that the <coughs> roads are green, meaning more passable, and the high friction areas are uh, reddish. So here's the uh, classic situation where <coughs> we have a, a target that we want to measure distance from or to in terms of some sort of uh, locomotion that can proceed 20 times more readily along those green pixels than the uh, red pixels. Given those two inputs, I go to cost distance, indicate that I want to measure distance from each pond on which only Brown's pond has been selected, and I want to use friction as my quote unquote cost register raster in order to create this uh, new grid that I'll call um, how many minutes uh, from Brown's pond. And the result is conceptually the same as what I generated a moment ago. That is to say, here we measure distance to Brown's Pond as the crow flies. And here we're measuring distance. Sorry. There we go. Distance <coughs> to uh, Brown's Pond as the crow uh, walks. At the end of the agenda outlining this lecture will be a hands-on tutorial intended to walk students through a deliberate series of specific challenges and insights. This might take a half hour or so, and it's done in anticipation of a homework assignment that will call for several hours of effort over the following week. In support of that homework assignment, students have access to hundreds of pages of online handouts that have been specifically created for this class. 
They can also pose questions at weekly sessions with teaching assistants or to an online question and answer forum that is always active and monitored not only by the professor and the teaching assistants, but also by fellow classmates who are drawn from both Yale and Penn. Significantly, each week's homework is submitted to an online folder where each student can look at the work of others, and every student is encouraged to do just that. So let's do the same. Notice here how many of these submissions include pictures of a horse. The reason for that is that this homework assignment was issued as you see here. And while you read through this assignment, let me click on this link in order to give you a clearer idea of what motivated this particular problem and the audience to whom students were asked to direct their solutions. That one's a tricky one. Always. Always. A Y makes an A sound, so it's A. Say E T T T T T Look at the picture. Those solutions tended to look like this. Seriously playful. Or is it playfully serious? Keep that distinction in mind as you consider several additional responses to homework assignments in this course on introductory geospatial information technology. For example, if I wanted to go from my house to the least distance ice cream shop, or my house to the greatest distance ice cream shop, I think I'll pick the greatest distance ice cream shop. I think I'll pick the least distance, the least distance ice cream shop. Euclidean distance, distance is a great, great tool. tool. And I'm going to sing a song about the raster calculator tool in GIS. The song is to the tune of Running on Empty by Jackson Brown. Yes! <laughs> when, you're, when you're reclassifying in GIS or classifying, and you're using raster, um, you know, you, you never really want to use no data. Every once in a while you do, but it gets you into trouble. Um, Big trouble. Some, what kind of trouble? Big, Big trouble! trouble. <laughs> Just to be clear, the woman just offshore of St. Thomas is now a doctoral student in Stockholm. The woman responsible for this origami is now a doctoral student in New Haven. So is this guy. And so is this woman who recently graduated and is now teaching at both Yale and Harvard. All playfully serious and all sharing a passion that was quite deliberately kindled at first, but which now burns just fine on its own. When I first started issuing notices like this at the end of each semester, my wife expressed concern that I might be generating more work than necessary. Sam has long since come to recognize, however, that this sort of thing is precisely why I've never really had to work a day in my life. Let me leave it at that for now. Except perhaps for this. <laughs>